Welcome to this once Watson commencement forum on new approaches to security and justice. So, by way of introduction, a few words. I'm Mark Blythe. I'm the director of the Road Centre for International Economics and Finance here at Watson. And one of the lovely things about Watson is you get to meet people who do things that are completely diametrically different from what you do and then sit on panels with them and get to learn from them. So that's kind of cool. Uh, so I do money and stuff like that, which is very little to do with what we're about to talk about. I did, however, begin my career as somebody who studied international relations. And back in the day, international relations was all about the Cold War and rockets and missiles and bombs and guns. And you know, there's certainly a little bit of that has surprisingly come back. But over the past 30 years, we've begun to realize that when we talk about security, there are many, many more issues involved to do with migration flows, to do with borders, to do with technologies of surveillance, and a whole host of other issues. And that's something that we have very much invested in at Watson over the past several years. And two of those investments are here with us today. So I'd like to introduce, first of all, going from my left, Stephanie Saville. She is the co-director of the Cost of War Project and senior researcher at the Watson Institute. She's a public anthropologist who researches militarism, security, and civic engagement in relation to the United States post-9-11 wars and also policing in Rio de Janeiro. She's the co-director of the Cost of War Project and serves as the editor of the project's research papers and executive director of operations. She is also co-author of The Civic Imagination, Making a Difference in American Political Life. Uh, and now I'm going to mangle it now that I've, you've told me, you've told me how to say it correctly. Ayeva Yusinete? Correct. Oh, brilliant, great. Lithuanian names can be tricky. Is the Watson family a university associate professor of international security and anthropology at Brown University. Her research and teaching interests lie at the intersection of political, legal, and medical anthropology, focusing on the social production of injury. She is the author of two books, Savage Frontier, Making News and Security on the Argentine Border, which examines how journalists both participate in and contest global and national security discourses and practices in a region portrayed as the hub of organized crime, and Threshold, Emergency Responders on the US-Mexico Border, which delves into the lives of Mexican and American firefighters, EMTs, and paramedics on both sides of the militarized international boundary. And I have to mention, she actually, as, a as, a, as an anthropologist, of course, became an emergency responder in order to do the work, which is quite remarkable, because you wouldn't catch me doing that anytime soon. <laughs> and with that, I will pass on first to Stephanie. All right. By um, the way, you can take your mask off if you're talking. Yes, That's thank the rule. you for the reminder, yes. Can everyone hear me OK? Yeah, OK. Thanks for being here early on graduation morning. Um, uh, could I have the first slide, please? Is there? Well, I'll, I'll start talking. Um, I, so I'm the co-director of the Cost of War Project. It's a, it's a research project based here at the Watson Institute, but it's, um, it draws on the research of uh, 50 scholars from around the country and the world. And um, we use research to shed light on the hidden social, economic, political, environmental, human costs of war, um, and really promote more public dialogue and critical thinking about this. Thank you so much. Just, just let me know when you need it changed, and I'll change it. <laughs> Thank I'll you, keep Mark. it simple. I knew I was here for a reason. <laughs> now we've found what my reason is. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, it's wonderful to have a, an assistant. <laughs> um, so this is a map that I've put together of um, of all the places that in the world that the U.S. is conducting some sort of counterterrorism operation. These are the U.S. post-9-11 wars. Um, these include more intensive actions like drone strikes and on-the-ground combat, um, also military exercises and training and assistance in the name of counterterrorism. This information is not published by the U.S. government in any kind of comprehensive way. And I put it together with a research team through various government sources, watchdog groups like Air Wars, and also pretty heavily relied on investigative journalism, um, particularly for the, the combat category, where we were capturing um, kind of on the ground raids and things like that, uh, exchanges of gunfire with militants. So the map shows 2018 to 2020. It's a bit dated now. These were the last years of the Trump administration. Um, 
it sh uh, during those years, there were air and drone strikes in seven countries, uh, and U.S. forces battled militants in eight countries, including Kenya, Mali, and Yemen. Uh, and I just thought I'd take a moment to bring it up to date. Uh, it wouldn't look that different today. Uh, so Afghanistan, August 29th, 2021, as U.S. forces were withdrawing from that country, there was a drone attack that killed 10 civilians. We, we, we saw that widely covered in the news. Um, in Syria, Biden conducted airstrikes against targets in February, June, September, October 2021, ground operations as well. On February 3rd, 2022, Biden announced that U.S. Special Forces in Northwest Syria had killed an ISIS leader. In Somalia, on February 24th, 2022, the very same day that Russia invaded Ukraine, uh, the U.S. conducted a drone strike targeting al-Shabaab militants in Somalia. And that fo followed four previous airstrikes in Somalia since Biden has taken office. So <laughs> this gives you a, a sense of the geographic scope of the post-9-11 wars. Uh, in general, what we at the Cost of War Project try to do is work against the U.S. media's common framing of armed conflict as primarily a military endeavor. Uh, that obscures the fact that it's primarily people in the war zones who bear the brunt of armed conflict, who suffer and who die in great numbers because of war. And I think we all in the United States have a heightened awareness of, of the impact of war on real people right now with the war in Ukraine. The U.S. media has done not a great job, I would say, overall in reporting on Ukraine, but a better job than in many armed conflicts in reporting on the human toll of, the, of war. Um, there are several reasons for this better coverage, one of which is about race, I think, and I'll talk about a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, but for now, I think the point is that we in the United States have a heightened sense of what war really means in a way that we, we didn't as much before uh, this tragic, tragedy. Um, cost of war research on the human toll focuses on, for example, um, Afghan children and women whose limbs get blown off by unexploded ordnance remaining in Afghanistan's landscape when they go to gather firewood or herd livestock. Afghan war widows who become addicted to heroin as the only way to cope with their psychological trauma. Contractors from places like Nepal in the war zones who face squalid and abusive working conditions and are effectively stuck there. Uh, U.S. veterans of the post-9-11 wars who are facing such a severe mental health crisis that four times as many of them, our research has shown, have died by suicide than in combat during the post-9-11 wars. That's over 30,000 people have died by suicide, vets and service members, since 2001. Abroad, the U.S. military has systematically failed to report on, compensate the families of victims, or even investigate allegations of civilian casualties from its attacks. And it's really essential to challenge the U.S. military's estimates of war deaths because the act of counting the war dead involves a series of hidden political, legal, and ethical decisions. The military's methods of counting are shaped by incentives to limit numbers of civilian casualties from its actions. Um, Next slide, please. Next slide. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so this is a uh, chart that my colleagues, Catherine Lutz and Nita Crawford, they are co-directors with me of the project and also the project's co-founders. Um, they put together an estimate of the human toll of the U.S. post-9-11 wars. Uh, so you'll see they included Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iraq, Syria, and Yemen, as well as a couple other places. Um, and the effort here is to, is to value lives lost, number one, to promote accountability for deaths, and to support efforts to increase legal restrictions on civilian casualties of U.S. attacks. So you'll see the, the conservative estimate of war dead from these, this, these wars is 929,000 people. This is just direct deaths. Uh, the, beyond this are the indirect deaths. So direct deaths is, you know, the weapons of war, bombs and bullets is the shorthand. Indirect death is all the ripple effects. So people die because of disease, war-related disease and malnutrition and the collapse of healthcare infrastructure. Uh, there are also mental health effects, a human toll that goes far beyond physical effects um, and could last into the next generation as the trauma is passed from today's children to their children. The next slide. Um, 
This is research by a con our contributor, David Vine, that shows that 38 million people have been displaced by these wars in eight countries where these have been most violent. And then, Mark, if you just could go back to the map real quick, and, and then uh, I won't need any more slides. Thank okay. you. But I found a role, and I'm not going to buy it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so just a brief um, glimpse into what the yellow icons mean. These are the, the training and assistance um, US is doing in 79 countries. Um, you'll notice that outside the Middle East, uh, Africa is a target region, still a very active focus of US uh, military efforts today. I went to Burkina Faso in 2020 to conduct a case study of one of these yellow data points of training, US training and assistance. What does that really mean and what are its effects? Um, so since 2009, the U.S. Has, has spent millions of dollars in, in training, weapons, funding for the Burkina Bay government to combat what local people call jihadists. And this started years before this type of militant violence was a problem in the region as it is today. The Burkina Bay government adopted the U.S.-driven narrative and resources of counterterrorism. Uh, they've, they're conducting their own war on terror, and they're prosecuting a minority ethnic group called the Fulani, which is a hurting ethnic group that has practiced Islam for centuries. Government security forces, as well as government-sponsored citizen militia groups, are conducting targeted killings of the Fulani, uh, calling them jihadists. And this fans, fans the flames of the outrage that many Burkina Bay feel already at a government that does little to uh, alleviate impoverished living conditions, and militants use this anger to recruit new members and build their insurgency. So in this way, so-called US security assistance is in fact intensifying uh, local conflict. This story is not unique to Burkina Faso, it's happening around the world. Governments are using US counterterrorism training equipment and funding and the narrative of the war on terror, the logics of the war on terror, to strengthen their longstanding confrontations with minority Muslim groups within their borders. I wanna to touch just very briefly uh, on the racialized logics of the US post 9-11 wars. Um, I think they're particularly evident in looking at this map. US post 9-11 operations are guided by what's called a logic of preemption. So the slightest, the idea is that the slightest possibility of attack by a foreign terrorist warrants preventative military action. The US's enemy targets are largely Muslim. It's a religious identity, which US discourses and actions have made into both a political and a racial category. When launching the war on terror, President George W. Bush used centuries old racialized language when he claimed he wanted the US military to be, quote, ready to strike at a moment's notice in any dark corner of the world. In US counterterrorism in Africa in particular, we see racist and colonial logics being reproduced in the US government's diagnosis that central governments should extend military control to what it calls ungoverned spaces, uh, and that the US should aid fragile states, and there's some um, really wonderful analyses showing the, the continuities between colonial kinds of language and these types of language that are used today. And just a final note that we may think of these things as very far away, but uh, the racism of militarized US foreign policy is really tied up with domestic racism and militarism. So, for example, the, the logics that target Muslims as terrorists are intimately connected with police violence against black and brown people here in the United States. Um, it, police militarization is as old as US policing itself, but it's exploded since the launch of the post 9-11 wars. And this intensification has not just been a byproduct of the era, it's been an intentional effort by US strategists to encourage police departments to adopt military grade weapons and equipment and to employ veterans returning from the wars. The state always also uses the terrorist label against black communities, political activists, and others. So the dynamics I've been discussing, uh, it's, they're, they're wrapped up in some of the violence that we know much more intimately. Uh, by way of conclusion, I'll just say that at the Cost of War Project, we do a lot of behind the scenes work to bring our research into the public domain. It's consistently f featured in top media outlets. And we put our, our research in the hands of people who can use it to advocate for change, uh, including uh, Congress people and their staff. When we succeed, 
We're working against the racialized logics and unfounded myths about US militarism, militarism that are common in this country. We're promoting critical thinking about US war and pushing the US public to ask the big questions that often don't get asked, changing the public narrative in order to, to work against this country's militarized status quo. Again, I'm happy to come once. I'll actually set it up, I'll <laughs> press the button. I'll actually want to show some websites, so it might be a little a task. Okay. That's quite probably too much to be on me. <laughs> Without practice, yes. Um, okay, so the question that I will be addressing is pretty broad, and that is what happens when migration is criminalized? And more specifically in the United States, what happened when it moved from being something that's oversought by the Labor Department and later the Justice Department to the Department of Homeland Security. Security buildup on the US-Mexico border over the past 20 years not only hasn't produced the desired effects of um, stopping smuggling and unauthorized crossings, but it has become an extrajudicial mechanism for systematically wounding and killing migrants and asylum seekers. So what you see in this map, it is the latest one I could find of what's the present state of the border. Five years ago, there were 654 miles of the fence along the US-Mexico border. So that covered about one third of the entire length of the boundary. Um, there is a map that's maintained by the US Customs and Border Protection that shows this additional piece right there that wasn't included in that map. It's very difficult to actually um, get this information um, from, from the government and I will explain why. So since, so 654 miles five years ago, the Trump administration built about 450 new miles um, but most of those were replacements of older dilapidated fences and sometimes replacements of what were known as vehicle barriers with pedestrian type uh, fences or secondary barriers. But the government also built only around 50 miles of new primary barriers where none existed before. So today the border fence extends for 706 miles. Although the government had built over 800 in the last like 30 years, it only extends for 706 miles. The wall's failure as a security infrastructure is very well known. So it doesn't stop illegal drugs or unauthorized migrants, it only reroutes them, raising the costs for both forms of trespassing and thus making organized crime uh, more profitable in Mexico. Smugglers use some very archaic technologies, including tunnels and catapults and ladders, and it is very well known that biggest loads, when we talk about drugs, come through the ports of entry, mixed up in, in trucks that bring vegetables and fruit or in spare tires. So what is perhaps less known to those who don't live uh, near the barrier is its capacity to wound and kill. The existing fence has shown consistent results in what, what, as what in pre-hospital care is known as mechanism of injury. So during the ethnographic research with emergency responders in binational border communities in southern Arizona, and just a clarification, I actually was an EMT and paramedic before I started this project, so it was the other way around. It was, it's what exactly led me, <laughs> what made me interested to also put an ethnographer's lens onto the subject. So what I learned is that over the past two decades, border-related trauma has become so common, so routine, that emergency responders, paramedics began referring to the cement ledge abutting the border wall as ankle alley. And if we look at just the latest data, so from 2021, and only looking at migrants from Mexico who were hospitalized in the Tucson sector, which is a very large sector of the border, there were 136 of them and 39% of the wounded had uh, ankle fractures. If we count other leg injuries, lower extremity trauma made up more than half of all injuries, 13% had spinal injuries. Last month, physicians from the um, 
Level 1 Trauma Center in San Diego also published a letter in which they said that over the past two years, when the border fence became taller in Southern California, so it was increased to 30 feet tall, um, the amount of people they were see the number of people they were seeing with border wall fall injuries at their um, at the hospital increased five times compared to previous years and similar um, uh, trends have been observed in other areas along the border in New Mexico and Texas so the border um, the the border patrol strategy which has been implemented since the 1990s in the US has pushed migrants further away from populated areas, so the, the towns where these fences were first built, and made them travel over what the government documents call hostile terrain, so where uh, people become exposed to extreme environments. According to official estimates, which are alarmingly incomplete and therefore underestimate the amount of um, fatalities, more than 7,000 people have died crossing the militarized region in the last two decades. So this, this map um, in particular is only for Arizona. Let me pull up a better one. And uh, you can, it, it is maintained by the Pima County Officer of the Medical Examiner uh, together with this organization known as Humane Borders which leaves water for migrants in the desert. And you can see if you enter different years, this is for 2021, each of these dots um, represent recovered human remains, sometimes people's names are known and causes of death. Other, time, other times they are identified, but most people suffer, who die, it, it's either from dehydration or heat stroke, and those who survive live um, um, with, many of them live with a permanent limb or kidney damage um, for the rest of their lives. So let's get back here. Rather than being accidents, that is, unexpected occurrences that happen unintentionally and result in damage, these emergencies on the border are caused, by, are caused deliberately by policy. So criminalization of migration, in, aggravated by concerns with, with terrorism in the aftermath of 9-11, led the U.S. government to designate the border with Mexico as a source of threats and wage there what has been likened to a low-intensity warfare. Oops, sorry. There it is. So the border fence itself is uh, what, um, what the US Border Patrol calls tactical infrastructure. And this is a concept that perhaps is more suitable to a, a war front. And the agency also calls it a force multiplier. Border wounds do not work the same way as injuries linked to other histories and geographies of violence. So when trauma happens abroad, especially in countries um, or places governed by regimes accused of having a dubious human rights record, scars of torture or other bodily imprints of force become evidence of victimhood, a corporeal marker of persecution that often entitles an individual to asylum. But border wounds, um, because they, they are read often as proof of crime, not of vulnerability. In the borderlands, a broken an ankle often serves as evidence of an illegal entry into the country, and this has made the blurring of emergency medical services and border policing possible. So the provision of life-saving hospital care to injured migrants has become contingent on them being taken by the border, into custody by the border patrol, and then the border patrol accompanies them to the uh, hospital. Well, this was in the before times, um, because the pandemic has further exacerbated these effects. And already before it started, asylum seekers were being turned away from the border that was quite misleadingly called migrant protection protocols, also known as remain in Mexico. Rather than offering protection, it forced asylum seekers to wait for weeks and often months uh, in precarious conditions seeking refuge in makeshift camp, sh camps and shelters, vulnerable to extortion, kidnapping, and other forms of criminal predation with very uh, little to no access to healthcare or to justice. So in March 2020, when the government uh, announced it was shutting down the border to all non-essential travel, over, at that time, over 60,000 asylum seekers were waiting in northern Mexican towns to make their case in front of US immigration judge. 
And then all the hearings, of course, were suspended with the onset of the pandemic under Title 42. CDC authorized the Customs and Border Protection to do what they call summary expulsions of non-citizens at land borders, a rule that is wi wi widely viewed as uh, both illegal and lacking um, scientific basis. And this policy pushed even more people to wait in limbo on the other side of the border. And now, after hopes that this rule would at last be lifted this month, just last week, the courts ordered Title 42 to stay. So what this means is that the number of asylum seekers waiting in Mexico will further increase um, and more people will try to cross the border on their own, risking injury and death. S Customs and Border Protection data on uh, what they call apprehensions and encounters shows as much. So the numbers are this high that you can see in the, in the past year are that high in part because many people who are returned to immediately um, uh, expelled to Mexico, they try again and again. All, nearly 40% now of these are repeat encounters. So people who are trying again until they either make it or they get injured. So by, and I, I'm, I'm happy if anyone has questions to explain more of these dynamics as well as others. But by way of concluding, uh, I wanted to leave you with a question, which I hope is not a rhetorical question, and that is how come we continue to project our fears onto the border and despite evidence that walls don't work, what they are advertised for, make the wall our answer to concerns about insecurity. And even in theory, can security built on unjust foundations, on human rights violations, security that undermines justice, this is the type, topic of our panel, security and justice. So can security that undermines justice make our lives any safer? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Uplifting stuff for the morning. Uh, keep everyone happy. <laughs> Questions, thoughts, comments? Who wants to go first? There's a nice room. <laughs> to share your work and, and it's, it's, it's wonderful to kind of learn. Can you talk up a bit so people can hear you? Yeah, sorry, I'm saying, <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you for being willing to, to share your work and your analysis and your perspectives on, on this topic. I'm, I've, you know, I'm not really in this space, so it's something to kind of get to learn. And I have two questions. The first is, obviously, the most critical determinant towards our approach to security and justice and that balance or that push and pull is fundamentally dictated by policy. It doesn't matter so much you know, what kind of grassroots efforts are present if they don't translate to state or federal or even international global policy changes. So do you hold optimism? Do you hold pessimism? Is it sort of uncertain to kind of you know, perhaps characterize the possibilities, the prospects of realizing a more just, a more equitable, a more safer security protocol, whether that be at the state level, at the federal level, at the global level. Um, you know, what are what are your? your you said you had two questions. Let's do them both. <laughs> well, I'll, let's let's hear them. No, do them. Then they can answer together. The, the second one, I guess, is you know, part of the concern for security is perhaps uh, an issue more of rhetoric than of actuality. So not, so not an example that either of you brought up, but like when we were talking, for example, that the ban on immigration from Muslim countries that was proposed, and there was a senator, I forget which senator, who said that it's like having a bowl of Skittles, you know, and if one Skittle is poisonous, would you you'd take anything out of the bowl, right? So there's this very, I think, you could argue it's whether it's a sort of an American, consciousness thing, I would argue it's really a human, frankly, tribalistic, you know, argument of it's easy to tap into fears, right? There's like 1% thing, you know, a 1% chance of a, of a sort of catastrophe or something really, really bad happening, which is irrecoverable, you know, it's irreversible, and that justifies, or, you know, that, that's why we predicate all of our preemptive efforts. That's why we predicate all of these unjust and, as you argue, inhumane uh, approaches. And I'm wondering if you think that fear is utterly unjustified, if there is merit to that fear, if that's a myth, 
Uh, and what kind of, you know, again, what's your take on that fear? All right, great. Two good questions to get started with. Yeah. Um, so in regards to policy change, um, you know, we think about this quite a bit because we see ourselves as, as uh, um, you know, as I was saying, we, we see ourselves as at the Cost of War Project as, as putting our research into the hands of people who can advocate for change and that uh, a lot of times is um, civil society groups, advocacy groups. Um, but also, you know, we, we meet regularly with congressional um, staffers and, and share our research with them. Um, and, you know, it, it's, it's, hard to be, um, it's hard to be optimistic in the face of the military industrial complex, the, the power of which is quite remarkable in this country. And um, we had a paper that showed that uh, there, are, there were something like 700 uh, lobbyists per year like from the the military contracting industry in Congress over the past five years there's only 535 members of Congress so there are far more lobbyists from this industry than members of there's a revolving door um, there are all kinds of ways in which politicians use arguments about job creation that's one of these myths that we work against the fact that oh the military is a great job creator well, it turns out that actually if you were to invest the same amount of money in other sectors, it would create far more jobs, right? Um, so, uh, so it's a huge beat. I talk about it as a, just this enormous beast of a, you know, the military industrial complex. And I also, it's, so it's hard to imagine change uh, in a really meaningful way. And yet there are so many people in this country who are working on just that. And it's really heartening for me to work in partnership with them, to be part of a movement that's working for change. Um, and this is not a partisan movement. Uh, it might sound progressive, but there are lots of people we work with that are um, you know, Republican as well. Um, and uh, the, the, they're, they're creative and they're resourceful. And um, you know, there's all kinds of ways that all of us in this room can you know get involved in further efforts. I like to mention um, groups like Peace Action, which you can sign up for their you know email newsletters and very they, they have this handy tool where you can punch in your district uh, and write a letter to your member of Congress about the latest you know policy agenda item in relation to U.S. militarism, and that matters. Like sending letters to your Congress people, it really does matter. So. Um, there, there's a lot that all of us can do on these issues as well. I think it's, it's um, the, 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 it would be too um, tempting to become complacent in the face of the beast of the military industrial complex, but, there, um, but, but there's lots of things that we can do and we should do. Um, <clears throat> the, the, you know, discourses, absolutely, I mean, I think as, Anthropologists, uh, Eve and I are both anthropologists, and that's part of what we're analyzing here. Are you know is is discourses and the power of how fear can get mobilized uh, in the name of security, which both of us showed is not actual security, right? It's not. It doesn't mean safety. It doesn't mean well-being. Um, and um, uh, you know, I think there's. When you when you get into the the specifics, for example, of um, what who, the people who are called terrorists in this country, um, they we had another piece of research that showed that um, there have been something like a little over two hundred people killed in attacks by by um, foreign terrorists. I think it is uh, since two thousand one. So just you know little over a couple hundred people um, compared to the 929,000 that the U.S. has um, contributed to the deaths of abroad and at home. Um, and so I think, again, it points to the need of for, for, for asking different kinds of questions and really rethinking, um, you know, rethinking what, how can we reframe some of these, the, these fear-based discourses in a different forward-looking way that actually gets to questions of meaningful human safety.
safety and security. Um, and there are all kinds of groups, again, working on just that. There's an awesome movement called the Poor People's Campaign. Um, they, are, they, they take inspiration from Martin Luther King in working against the intertwined evils of poverty, militarism, and racism. Um, and they ta they, they're calling for, instead of kind of saying, we're against militarism, which I, you know, I, I think that has limited traction, honestly, in terms of kind of get, gathering people into the, the movement. Um, they're talking about calling for a third reconstruction and shifting, uh, they're calling for a moral budget in this country that shifts the funds for, that are currently, we spend just billions of dollars every year on the Pentagon, um, and shifting those and putting those in other buckets that can be used towards um, meaningful safety and well-being for all people in this country. Um, so I think there are groups that are really doing, you know, shifting the discourses in um, important ways. I'll just add a few um, brief, brief remarks to, to both of your questions, because I think Stephanie really did a great job answering the question. So first, I, I would disagree that we should see our approach dictated by policy. Policy shouldn't dictate anything. Policy should be dictated by research and science and by the, our values as society. So, and, and policies can change, obviously, it is a tool. Um, uh, and when it comes to rhetoric, yes, unfortunately, the security discourse is very much um, thrives on, on fear mongering and on um, scapegoating certain groups of people and on redirecting our attention from certain issues to others. So, uh, for example, in basically misplacing people's fears. People's fears are often very well founded, fears of not being able to um, support what their families, having precarious jobs, not having social safety net, but misplacing them on migrants and asylum seekers, for example, who come across the border. It's, they are not the problem, the reason. Um, why uh, there is this erosion of social, why we don't have social safety and security. Um, so there is a lot of misplacement. It's also fear mongering, uh, this rhetoric of insecurity is really, um, it's really powerful. It works for a lot of people. For On the one hand, it works for political groups because it really mobilizes uh, voters when you, uh, when you campaign on, on issues of fear and then very, clear responses like let's build a wall and then we'll be all safe and happy. Uh, and it's also good for business. So even the, when we talk about the construction of the wall, there are a lot of companies, um, base, very basic companies, companies that produce cement, but also companies that produce the war technologies and, and drones and other surveillance cameras that are also very much involved in what uh, Stephanie is studying. So it is a big business opportunity. Um, that's why it's so popular. Thank you for that. Before we move on, I'm just I'll get in the side. I just want to mention one thing. I'm sure you all read the Wall Street Journal, Financial Times, this sort of stuff. And there's lots and lots of articles just now asking the following question. Where did all the workers go? And we've seen all these ones about this, the, the drop in labor supply. You can't get workers anywhere. You notice how none of those articles ever mention the fact that we've effectively shut down immigration and migration? which used to contribute three to five million people to the labor force every year. And it, the answer is right in front of you, but we are deliberately blind to that answer. Sir. First off, uh, yeah, I really commend you guys for the uh, you know, great research. Um, I'm an international studies uh, graduate from 30 years ago, so it's fun to come back. Um, um, I just question about the, some of the border statistics because um, you know, it's just a huge increase in migrants, uh, you know, once Biden, Biden came in. And because you're close to the issue, and um, there still is that thorny issue of, of, you know, how do you absorb all those migrants um, in a responsible way that we can afford within our law? So, I mean, you're close to it. Do you have any ideas around that? Because it's, it's a tough issue, right? Yeah, it is a tough issue, but I think Mark just <laughs> gave a very good answer, is that there, is, there are a lot of sectors in this country that don't have enough workers. 
the problem with 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 this in, so on the one on the one hand you the real number like the increase is not as steep as you see in that chart because about almost well 40 percent of people are the ones that try again and again some of them try two times some of them try three times and they have been trying a lot in the past in the past two years i would say the last one year in particular when the pandemic sort of subsided somewhat um, and some of those people have been waiting there since since like late 2019 early 2020 so the longer these um, prohibitions of even considering asylum cases stay in place the more people will arrive at the border and wait so and these people are the ones that are requesting uh, asylum. So they want to make their claims in front of the immigration judge. There are a lot of other migrants who come to this country to work on temporary visas, for example, in, in the summer. And those have also those programs have been suspended during the pandemic for a while. Some of them have been restarted now. Um, the, the thing is that US needs a, a comprehensive immigration reform. Yes, it's on. Is it on? Go for okay, because I don't have a super strong voice. I have a, a question for Stephanie. Um, I generally share your point of view about the military industrial uh, complex. I also have, I mean, over the years, developed a, an understanding or a, a point of view that in the higher, high levels of the military, there are l many very smart, thoughtful, um, caring people in those jobs. And my question was, do you ever engage with them to try to you know, share information directly? Yes, um, and it's, it's funny because when I do meet the most high level, um, some of the most high level people in the military, we often um, find common ground immediately. Um, there was one, um, former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, I met him at a media event, and he um, he said to me, uh, he he kind of listened to my w what I did. I, I ran the ran the Cost of War project, and he said um, he said we should never send our sons and daughters needlessly to war, um, and he, so he was agreeing with me in that way, and and he and and that is the crux of how we're not at all. Um, working against the people in the military because um, we all care about not needlessly wasting human life, right? And, and our vets uh, included very much so. So, um, it, the, the, you know, I think um, there's a lot of ways that we, um, we and, and also I get, I get emails all the time from someone who hears something and, and you know, a former general who says, keep pushing the envelope. Our, you know, the military needs this, our country needs this, you guys need to keep doing what you're doing, this is so important. So we, ha we really do have a lot of, there's people um, in the military who say, oh, I used your Burkina Faso paper, um, you know, to, it's tricky because there are, there's a lot of also forces <laughs> that, that tend towards inertia. Um, and a lot of what I'm talking about is structural in that it, it goes beyond the intentions of any one person, right? So as much as we might share, um, you know, have a nice moment and a nice exchange with, with someone like this, this guy that I was talking about, the, <laughs> you know, I, I truly believe that as much as people would want to do things differently, there are a lot of ways in which um, things, are kind of the pattern, the cycles continue and the patterns continue and the, the structures are in place and it's very, very hard to break out of those. Um, so uh, yeah, I do know that, the, that sometimes they, they are using our numbers, but we also get a lot of pushback in a lot of ways too. Um, we've had the military contesting our numbers of, of war dead in Afghanistan, for example. Um, and yet we've also seen like uh, Biden actually in his uh, withdrawal speech about Afghanistan 
cited our numbers. He said, you know, researchers at Brown University have said that, you know, this war has cost two million dollars, or two, two trillion, sorry, two trillion dollars. Um, and there was a time when, back when Nita and Kathy founded the project in 2010, 2011, when that would have been unheard of for a, a you know, a president or pr any prominent public official to take our numbers, because what we do is say, you have to look beyond the Pentagon numbers for the budget. It's not just the money that the Pentagon has spent, it's the fact that we've spent money on veterans care post 9-11 wars. These are credit card wars, so there's, war, there's interest on war borrowing. There's all kinds of ways that this has inflated the Pentagon budget, right? Um, so when, he, when Biden uses our number, it's a signal that we've shifted something in terms of um, an acknowledgement that the costs are far bigger and deeper than they readily admit to. So I, I, I think that that's an, the other part of my answer to your question is that we're, we're continually kind of like, yeah, pushing the envelope and getting, and, and just at the simple act of getting a number to be commonly used is a way of acknowledging a whole host of things. Um, so. Thinking about this, are we at an era of concern for the new border being Europe and, you know, where war is, like what the, the funds were putting towards Ukraine, right? I, I see these all in phases, right? At Trump, it was all about, uh, you know, the border with Mexico, you know, and, um, and now I kind of feel like we're dusting off what was the Soviet era when I studied here 40 years ago, right? It's mm. kind of that old school, we got a... The eastern border. The eastern border. Yeah. So I just want your kind of thoughts on that because I think our memory, I mean, it's so great, the research you're doing, but the cost of war and what we're doing in Africa, it just is not covered, right? And, you know, we have the rhetoric like, Oh, it's all about Mexico and the immigrants, you know? And I think now it's shifting, or we're going into a new era that's going to just keep building. Because, you know, the headline will be, let's send 44 billion to Ukraine. And this is just gonna escalate. So I would just want your thoughts on, on this. Keep up the great work uh, and keep highlighting it. We need it out there in the media for people to get educated too. We've got someone here and then we'll go. Go ahead. Um, well, as someone who was born on the other side of that Berlin Wall, I'm from Lithuania, I was born in the 1980s in the Eastern Bloc on the other side of the wall. Um, I find your question very important. Um, unfortunately, I do not think that the Mexican wall or immigration will stop being an issue in US politics anytime soon. It goes in phases since the 1990s. You will, you will see with the elections maybe next year picking up, it will come back on everyone's agenda again, and maybe we'll go down and up again. It's just we see it in waves. Um, I think it is the, the U.S. focus on Ukraine will probably not be as long-lived as U.S. interest in what's happening on the border because it is it affects fewer people in this country um, than the question of immigration. That's just my general um, thought. What happens with, obviously we, we see this shift now in NATO's eastern borders and with Finland and Sweden probably joining and what will happen with, with other countries, that region is getting much more attention, but looking from at least the rhetoric of the US government, there was no intention of retur returning to that confrontation in, during the Cold War with Russia. Even now, there is more, the politicians seem to be more interested in, in China's role in, or whether, whether we will defend Taiwan or will not defend Taiwan, that was not even a question with Ukraine. So I'm skeptical that it would become as important again, but this is really um, prediction. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I think, I think there's a lot of ways that the, 
the military certainly is talking about, you know, great great power competition with Russia and China, and and that is uh, unfortunately um, the direction of a lot of uh, public discourse right now is turning this awful war in Ukraine into a uh, so, like somehow making it about the U.S. right and and the fact and the fact that here's the comp you know we're not going to stop until Russia. Uh, is weakened um, when it should be really about you know <laughs> Ukrainian people and their lives and their sovereignty right that's that's what the the conversation needs to foreground and it doesn't um, so uh, I do think that the I, I think that the weapons manufacturers are really having a field day right now the, their stocks are going way up um, there, there's a lot of ways that the, the kind of U.S. Um, war fever that we're seeing um, is really useful to a lot of people in a, you know, in the political economic sense. Um, so, uh, so I think that, that even if Ukraine fades from the headlines, those things are going to, um, those things are going to continue. And, and, um, and we do see the, you know, this as one of the latest justifications for U.S. militarism. Time for one more question right here. I actually want to comment, and, and thank you so much for this. I did not know what I was coming to see this morning. It was attached to my daughter's brunch that I'm supposed to go to. So um, this has been very interesting, and I really appreciate it. Um, I also think it's, um, th I'm just going to bring this back to my background is in advertising and marketing. Um, so I'm looking at this from the scope of how do we reach the people? And, and I will also share that I'm from Georgia. We, we live in Atlanta, Georgia. I live in an area and I have relatives who are very, very, um, they support the wall and they support war and they support and they vote at, down the line for all of these things that are to me so frustrating and I, have a, I can't engage in conversation with people that <laughs> you know I do love but I cannot engage in conversation. And I feel like we talk we, we can be in a room like this, like-minded people, and we can, be, we can all be agreeing that these numbers are terrible and these maps are, you know, wow, that's, it's, I, that's amazing how much that is and, and all of these things, and we're all like-minded. And do you ever have conversations in your groups about how do we, because it, I don't care what numbers we throw at these people. I mean, if we can't make an argument mm -hmm. to ban gun laws, to I mean, Georgia's a right to carry state. Like, if I can't convince people that when there's a shooting every other day and children are dying, that we should have gun laws, there's none of this is going to make the hills being a difference. Mm -hmm. So, do you ever have? Do you ever get into the idea of how do we how do we talk in bumper sticker language the way that? <laughs> You know what I mean? The people who are winning this political war are talking in bumper stickers. We don't do that. We're much smarter than that, right? <laughs> but you know, but we're not. We're not reaching. We're not reaching the general public who are voting these people in and who are supporting the idea of lobbying and not having rules on lobbying, which is what's winning. You know, that's what's winning. And, and it's so frustrating. And the whole, I mean, literally, I have a brother who employs a woman who's crossed the border four times because she goes back to see her seven children. And she keeps coming over the border. And he keeps voting against immigration <laughs> policy. <laughs> but yet, she's a member of their family. Right. I mean, how do we, what, is there any discussion on how do we start talking about her stickers to these people? Because I think intellectual with them isn't working. I want to get an answer yeah. to you, but I think you kind of just answered it. It's called living hypocrisy. That's, that's what we do. But all right, you got a two finger, then we'll, we'll extend a little bit, and then we need to sort of wrap it up. So, you know, I love your research and looking at the cost of war. So, a little background. So, I was also an officer of the US military. I did ROTC at Brown, but it wasn't actually ROTC here. Yeah. Um, so, I as a military officer, I was always taught that, you know, the reason to have a big military is actually not to go to war, mm -hmm. but you, you, you're trying to create deterrence. And we obviously see that policy side of that is very important as well. You, know, you talk about different reasons why there's a war in Ukraine right now, but one would be that clearly Putin was not deterred. Um, so have you ever looked in your research at the cost of a deterrence versus the cost of war? 
you know, because deterrence in some ways is kind of like a, it's a it's an investment, but it's not just military. Like there's other reasons you can invest in that. But have you looked at that? Because you can't look at the cost of war alone by itself, right? So what's the counterfactual of the cost of war? And to go to the other point, basically, are we just living hypocrisy, or is a bit is there a way of getting through that mess, getting through that to a better space? Right. So let's roll on those two. Um. <clears throat> The, uh, it's a really, yeah, I mean, I think that that is, a, that's another reason um, anthropologists have shown that, that um, you know, <laughs> nuclear scientists often uh, are progressives who are working, thinking that they're going to be building up, that this is a progressive policy because this is a way of deterring the use of nuclear weapons, right? The problem with, with that kind of logic is that, well, we spend more than the next 10 countries combined on our military, so, so it's not even close. Um, we spend way more. Um, and when, when that happens, that huge investment in all of these bases, there are more than 800 US bases all around the world, all of these weapons, right? There, there is a tendency that when you create all of that stuff and the infrastructure, much higher tendency for it to be used, right? So um, the, the, this, yeah, I, I think that you're, you're laying the groundwork. There's a, um, this contributor of ours, uh, David Vine, wrote a great book um, uh, in which he showed that, the, that the, the, there's a link between the bases being abroad and, and the U.S., because, because the U.S. is right there. It's so easy to just send forces in to the conflict because, you know, it, so, so it's not because of the bases that were involved in the conflict, but it facilitates that. Um, so I do think we need to be careful of, of those kinds of logics. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I, I think that there's a, a way in which we need to bring what we're talking about to, um, to make more sense to people. It's proven in the world that you work in that um, you're not going to change people's minds with numbers, statistics, critique, <laughs> all the stuff that academics are, do. Um, and so I think a lot about that, you know, I've, I see the climate change movement in some ways as a model because there's been a real shift in this country's acknowledgement of climate change even being an issue. Um, and that's, that beca became what used to be like this progressive thing. And now it's something that's much more commonly understood to be um, science and fact. Um, and, uh, you know, there's, there was this woman who was talking, this activist who was talking about how if you can talk about it in terms of like positives, like we're, we're having a conversation, we agree on that the fact that and, and bring it to the local level so like in this town in georgia we want more jobs did you you know guess what there are far less jobs created by the military than than um in other sectors so so just kind of being able to to have conversations on the level of like first stating it in terms of what do, what are our shared values what are we what are we um what are we working towards together um and bringing these kinds of um critiques into into discourses and language in a way that that can connect with respect to other people, no matter um, where they're coming from. That is how you change minds, you know. Um, so uh, I, I hope to be contributing to to those kinds of conversations. Last word. <laughs> very briefly. Um, yeah, it is very. I think it is very hard to show people or for all of us see how hypocritical we can be in, in our lives on, on so many different aspects. Um, and uh, one way to look, especially to think about migration or to talk about migration would be to, to, look, to, to try to emphasize the positive of what migrants bring to this country and we have had that in this country it was built on built by migrants which is also somewhat problematic because there was a lot of done to indigenous people in this country that we kind of forgot when we elevated this, this migration myth but i think there were some good things in in that story of us being migrants in the american dream that we need to 
reinvigorate. I think very often just having personal connection can help people wrap their minds around an issue and be more open-minded. On the other hand, hearing from you, it seems that it doesn't always happen because we are very hypocritical. And if money doesn't always um, help us see if, if, we, if we think that building a wall is more important than investing in healthcare on, or in education, it's, it's um, I think that then the last resort is really thinking about justice and what, what would be the right thing to do. So just the last example, crossing the border not through the designated port of entry is a misdemeanor. If you try again, it is a felony re-entry, and that th those laws have been recently changed, but it is a misdemeanor if you cross the border without authorization. What other misdemeanors do we know? Shoplifting is a misdemeanor. A minor in possession of alcohol is a misdemeanor. Trespassing, and for or driving under the influence. But for these other violations of the law, we do not, we do not build roads with hairpin curves so that people who are driving under the influence would get injured and die because they violate the law. We don't chop off the hands of people who shoplift in the same way, like building a wall is just a disproportionate, displaced um, policy. And we'll leave it on that. Thank you all for joining us.